where Hare Krishna lives. Friday night in the Bhagavad Gita, we had, a, we had a good time. Krishna was sharing us about the mind, about your mind, and about the things that go on in your mind, and how you deal with the things that you go on, what go on in your mind. And you're learning more and more and more that because of the power that's coming down to the, from the universe now, you can bring yourself into the presence of things that you never knew existed before and set yourself free and become free for this. See, every one of you that's got a problem, every one of you that's stressed out under a serious problem, every one of you that's been held down, maybe you haven't been able to get the kind of job that somebody else has. Maybe you haven't been able to get the kind of house that somebody else has. Maybe you haven't been able to get the kind of car that somebody else has. It's the system. And look what's happening to the systems all over the world. And it's geared especially for one thing, to set you free. To set you free. Because if somebody cannot have it nice, and somebody cannot have an opportunity, then that's, it's nobody's shit. Everybody's got to have that. If little kids in Africa are starving to death, then nobody's got the right to launch missiles or shoot things off or spend money on crazy things until those kids are taken care of. That's the God way. That's the new way of thinking. And it's a revolution. It's a real revolution. And it's a revolution of And I am not one bit afraid of it. In fact, we were talking about this morning, but we're bicycling these tapes all over the country. There's a fellow in Muskegon, Michigan, that has a store. And he wrote me, you know what he's doing? He's taking the whole back of the store and he's turning it into a TV viewing room. And he's playing our tapes in the back and people are coming in and picking up stuff right in the middle of Muskegon, Michigan. And they're showing these tapes up in this church, up in Unity Church, up in uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, all over the place, getting great letters from people. And then people in New York, and, and really, uh, New York City, we're, we're getting so much support from New York City now. It's, it's very, very exciting because people know this is real and it's true and it's right. And you're watching it on television. God, if you read about this in the Bible, you say, oh, God really moved in a mighty way. You're watching it on television, and people don't even know what to make of it. They don't know what to say. But you know what to say. You know? Lift up missiles of love and let the missiles explode with flowers. I mean, remember back in the flower power, back in the Woodstock days and all that kind of stuff? Lift it up now. This is the time to do it. There's nothing can stop you now. In those days, the system was strong. Now... The power has come down and the system's not as strong as it used to be. When you see on television people standing in front of the offices of the KGB in the Soviet Union tearing down the statue of the head KGB guy and the KGB guys are looking out the window saying, Oi, Gavolt, what, what, what? You know something's up. Something's up. Join them. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. And Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, 32, learn a parable of the fig tree. Why the fig tree? What's so special about the fig? You know what's so special? You know why the fig is so popular in mysticism and all ancient religions? Because it's unique. It blossoms on the inside. Oh, a fig can look pretty ugly on the outside, but you know what? When you slice it open, it, it explodes in color and blossoms on the inside. That's why the fig is, is, a, is considered uh, a, the holy in mysticism. So page 26, Matthew 24, verse 32. And Jesus Christ says, learn the parable of the fig tree. And what, does he say about the, what does he say about the fig tree? When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves. When his branch, Jesus Christ said, he's the vine, you're the branch. In other words, when you start going into meditation, when you start plugging into this melatonin stuff, when you start activating the pineal gland, when you start looking up to Aquarius, when you start plugging into the universe, when you start plugging into dolphins, when you start plugging into nature, things are going to change inside of you. And when these things change inside of you, you're going to feel better. You're going to think differently. You're not going to judge other people. You're not going to criticize other people. You're going to start getting consumed in this oneness with everybody. You're not going to be separated because religion. You're not going to follow groups or organizations anymore. You're going to just follow that which is the inner spirit. And Jesus Christ says, when you start feeling that way, that means there's leaves starting to come on the tree. And when leaves start to come on the tree, you know what he says? Summer is close. Look what he says. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. That means summer is near. Even at a young and tender experience in meditation, you'll start feeling differently. Ask people. You, you talk to people that come here. And it's none of my business. They don't follow me. God, thank God they don't follow me. They're following that light which is within themselves and something happens, you know. There is this feeling, I never, what the, I'm worried about dolphins. I never even knew there was such a thing as dolphins except Flipper. I thought that was the only dolphin that ever was. I didn't know there was real ones. Beaching themselves, 
beaching themselves on the sands, committing suicide. Dolphins are committing suicide. And we run down with all of the technicians to find out why are the dolphins committing suicide? Do you know why the dolphins commit suicide? Look at this young lady sitting here. Do you have an idea why? She doesn't know why the dolphins commit suicide. She didn't know there was dolphins either. She thought that was just flipper, just like me. <laughs> but what happens when kids commit suicide? Where are all the technicians? Where are all the, where's all the examinations? When teenagers in the United States are beaching themselves, where's anybody to say why? What's going on? <coughs> so Jesus Christ says, Summer is the time of love. What do you do? You in the winter. You, most of you, you know what you do? The church fills up in the winter time. You don't have anything else to do. You come here. You got your coats on. Well, there's nothing else to do. Well, I'm going down here. But in the summertime, you go on your hand. But you're filled with life. You're out. You're exposing yourself on the beach. And you're getting a gold and tan and all of this beautiful stuff. You're alive. You're filled with life in the summertime. And Jesus says that when you start getting into this and you start feeling differently, there are the leaves that are coming out that are telling you summer of your life is very close. The winter of your life is coming to an end. All that has been dark within you is about ready to give way to the light. All that has been dark within you is about ready to give way to new color. You go through the, you go through the changes and some of them are pretty difficult. A lot of people say, well, since I've been meditating, things that seem like they're worse. They're not. You know what Buddha said about that? He said, if you sit in the cesspool long enough, you won't even smell it anymore. He said, well, this is pretty nice. How do you like my place? Did you ever go into somebody's house? <laughs> How do they stand? They don't even know it smells. <laughs> Sometimes we have that. You know, the couple of dogs go out, it's raining, invite everybody over. Hi, come on in, sit here. <laughs> doesn't smell to me. It smells all right to me, right? You didn't smell anything in your house. Your house never smells, does it? Of course not. Because we all get used to our unique smell. Somebody else, I used to be an insurance adjuster years ago, and I go to people's houses, you know, someone, come on in. You know these women, they've got their floppy slippers on, the bathrobe, got a cigarette out of their mouth. I went a little behind on my work, you know, stuff is piled over there. Yeah, brush this stuff off, sit down, you know, place stinks, you know. How could you live like? But all of a sudden, you know what happens? When you think that things have gotten worse because you're into meditation, all of a sudden, you're aware that you're living in the pig pen. All of a sudden, you say, my God. You're aware that things are not like they should be, and you say, I'm getting the heck out of here. I am getting out of here. But before that, we're blind. The summer of your life is near. The Upanishads of Krishna says this about the fig tree. This everlasting holy fig tree stands with roots above, and branches down. See? Its roots are above. Sometimes you see an ancient mysticism that had the roots coming up like this. See? And then the branches coming down like this. Why? Because it lifts, you lift the lower part of yourself up to the higher realms to receive that. It's the water which comes down from the higher consciousness. And then when the trees and the fruits start to pour forth in its branches, you lay your branches down to share them with whomever will come along. That's why the roots are up and the branches are down. The holy fig tree. So what does it say in Matthew 24, 33? So likewise, when you see all of these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. What are you going to see? Look, because you've been watching on television. You know what Jesus calls that? Earthquakes in diverse places. You know what earthquakes are? Everybody is shaken down with all of the old crap that they've had to live with all of their life, and inside of themselves something shakes and says, I don't believe that anymore, and I'm not following that anymore. Let it crash. You saw it all week on television. That's earthquakes in diverse places. The abomination of desolation, you know what that is? That means the horror of the fact that you realize that the right hemisphere of your brain, that holy place is desolate, there's nothing going on there. When you realize that the right hemisphere of your brain is desolate and you're going to start cultivating it, when you start feeling those shaking downs that you're not interested in following the old ways anymore, then get ready because the leaves are coming on your tree and heaven's knocking at your door right now, right now, right now is the time. And that's the changes from winter to summer. You're at the door. But you know there's people out here, they have no idea. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Have no idea. And, and in fact, I'm, I've been called every name in the book. So what? Who cares? You know? But, but, and, and, and they come against you because they, they've got to protect their old way. I mean, you know, the, I feel sorry for these guys, the preacher. I mean, i got a job. I say, if you all go, nobody comes. Me and the blonde load up the dogs, the cat, we go to Key West. That's the end of that. Wasting away in Margaritaville, searching for my last shake. What? So what? What? That's nice. I'm gone. 
But these guys get paid. Their whole life is making you believe in this stuff. They got kids, they're going to school. They got Blue Cross. They got the Blue Cross, they got the Social Security. Who's gonna pay? What's gonna pay for it? They got a free house. What are they gonna do if all of a sudden everybody says this is wrong? Who's gonna pay for the kids? Who's gonna pay the Blue Cross? Who's gonna pay all of this stuff? So they gotta continue to get you to believe this. They can't change it. That's the same thing as what happened. It's called old line hardliners that will never budge off of that thing. But they're gonna be budged. You see what the people in Russia did? They took that statue, they wrapped the cable around its neck, and they pulled it down. That's exactly what will happen. You know what Jesus Christ said about the cathedrals? Do you know what he said about all the big churches? Do you know what he said about all the holy places? Ain't going to be one rock left standing on top of the other. Why? Because the people are going to pull it down. You're going to pull it down. And you're going to set people free. And you're going to blast out those stained glass windows, because as long as you've got stained glass windows in your church, you can't see the hurt going on outside. You've got it all painted in all beautiful scenes. Oh, isn't this lovely? And outside there are people that are starving, there are people that are sick, there are people that are shooting and killing each other. But you can't see it because the organ plays in the stained glass and oh, this is wonderful. It's not wonderful. Jesus said in Revelation 3, I have set before you an open door. Meditation is the open door. So you don't be frightened about things. In spite of what they say, in spite of how you feel, keep doing it. When your knees are shaking at the worst, that's when it's time to meditate. Brother, I'll tell you something. When we lost this dog, and this still hurts me, and I just, was, I just didn't think of anything possible that could, good, could good come out of losing that little flower, my knees were shaking. I was filled with hate and remorse, but I continued to do it even a little bit at a time and finally was carried above this thing and finally was able to restore my soul, Joan able to restore her soul, understanding the beauty of this, understanding the life that goes on, understanding the the fact that there is no death, but that this life continues to perpetuate itself in a beautiful way. But you never know that. I have a, 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 a girl in my office who's the office manager. Her son, it's a black family, a lovely family. Her son used to be one of the dancers with a group called Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince out of Philadelphia. Will Smith, I don't know if you've seen these, you know who these guys are. About three weeks ago, he came in the house about 10.30 and he says to his mom and dad, Listen, I've got to go over to Charlie's or whatever, and I'll be back in about an hour and a half. So if I'm a little late, don't wait up, but I'll be right back. I'm, just, I'm, I'm in town, and I'll be right back. And um, about 2.30, they heard this tremendous crash. And they woke up, and they ran out of the house, and there they saw about 300, 200 feet from the house, the headlights wrapped around this tree. They, they didn't dare go near the car. Who else could it be? And the police and everybody came, and they called, and they needed somebody to come down to identify a body. The son was killed. Bing! Just like that. Like that. No warning. Absolutely nothing. The shock. Your only son killed 100 feet from your house, waking you out of sleep with this tremendous crash. What do you do? How do you deal with that? Somebody going to tell you meditate? Pray? There's nothing. Nature itself eventually has to lift that, that, that veil from you. But you know, as I talked to her and I said, look, and it's so hard to understand this, but you're dwelling on this plane right here. That's your conscious plane. Right now, Erwin, who is very much alive, is dwelling on that plane. There's no way in, in, on the face of the earth that you can understand these things until you lift yourself up to that plane and touch that place where he is. Otherwise, you can't understand it. Never can understand it. You can never understand the fact there is no death. Nothing dies. Nothing can die. The body, yes, your body is put into a box and they do what they do with it. But that which is the you, look at yourself sitting here. There's not bodies looking at me, you're looking at me. Your eyes aren't looking at me, you're looking at me. You're peeking out, you're using those two eyes in the front of your head as a camera and they're transmitting a picture of me to you. And I've got a transmitter that's going, making all kinds of stupid vibrations in the earth and that's not half the funny thing. Inside of your ears are two little ding-dongs hanging down going blah, 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 blah. And they're sending a coded message and it sounds like I'm talking. I'm not talking. I'm going, Brrr. you're going, Brrr. it's making sense to you. So you think you know something. You know nothing already. For cock the with this. What? <laughs> your little antennas are waving in the breeze, picking up all of this stuff. <laughs> Sometimes you honk your horn. It's all, it's all the same stuff. Nothing but machinery. But inside of this gorgeous piece of machinery is you. Lurking in there. But when that machinery breaks down and you can no longer drive it, 
they take it to the junkyard. They don't take you with it. They don't take you with it. You will be born again, and born again, and born again. That's the way it is. And the earth shows this to you. The trees show it. Summer comes, and then the winter. But then summer comes again, and then the winter. And summer comes again, and it's nature's way of saying, you're not getting out of it this cheap. You're going to come back here until you figure this thing out by yourself. And many of you have got a lot of it figured out. So, that, so it's not the end that's coming. It's just the beginning. And it's a great time. Exciting, exciting time. Do you know that Uranus now is only about 18 and a half years from the rendezvous with Gaia in, the, in Aquarius, and the marriage is going to take place? And you're seeing all of this stuff going on in the world, and you can be a part of it, understand it. And these people sit not having the slightest idea what the heck's going on. You're going to tell them. Tell them about the God in Memphis. Start that today. Go up to the church and tell them, did you know? <laughs> oh, who told you that? <laughs> yeah, God is Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> but now we show up. Watch. Jesus talked about the stars are going to fall out of the sky. He said the sun is going to go dark. He said the moon is going to go dark. Abominations and desecrations and all of this stuff. Here is proof that Matthew 24 has nothing to do with doomsday fears that you're taught by religion. Nothing to do with it at all. The moon is not going to shut down. The sun is not going to shut down. The stars are not going to fall out of the sky. They're all symbolic terms for things that happen within you. How do I know that's a fact? Look at Matthew 24, verse 34. Jesus. Verily, that means I'm telling you the truth. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. You know what he's saying to you? Those people, just like you, until the sun goes dark inside of you. In other words, until your mind shuts down so you can start looking up at heaven. Until the moon goes black, which means until your emotions no longer control you. Until the stars fall out of heaven, until those sparks of light, which are divine energy, come down into you. You shall not pass up into that higher realm. You have to go through that shaking. You have to go through that enlightenment. You have to shut down the sun, which is your lower mind. You have to shut down the moon, which is your emotions. You have to enter into meditation. And until you do all of these things, you shall not pass up into that higher realm where God dwells. Makes no difference. Is that what <laughs> See? That's all. What, do, what did he say? Did he say this generation shall not pass? Did the stars fall out of the sky? Then if they didn't, he's a liar. Right? Did the moon go black? No. If it didn't, he didn't know what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. He's saying, see what happens? You come into this, and then you come back, and you come back until you learn, and you finally plug in, you turn on the pineal gland, the melatonin flows, the doors to the right side open up, and you then trot in there and become one with that which is God. You return to the Father's house. That's what the prodigal son is all about. Jesus is saying, that's what you've got to do. When you do, okay, then you'll pass. Watch what I'm talking about. Go to uh, Book of Revelation, page 228. <coughs> wow. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 12. See, look, watch. You come into this cycle. Stay with me for a minute. Before you, here, you're coming into this circular cycle of life. You're born, you die, you're born, you die, you're born, you die. You're a clock. It's like a clock. It's, that's what being born again is, okay? But then, when you have hit that, where you hit that pineal gland, you hit the right side, then all of a sudden, you go out of this orbit here, and you become one with that which is God. Okay? Don't try to get up here and figure this one out. That's beyond thought. But that's what this is all about. Rebirth is the cycle of the zodiac of the clock. A continuing cycle of born again, dying, born again, dying, born again, dying. But then when you touch it, you go, and you don't come back here. In that particular way. Okay, we don't go into that. But watch. Revelation 3. With me, Revelation 3? Okay, let's go to chapter, to verse 12. Him that overcomes, that means overcomes your own lower mind, Will I make a pillar in my temple, that's inside of your head of my God, and he shall go no more out. Watch, see that? That means you will no longer have to go back out into the world and continue this perpetual cycle. You will overcome, you will learn, and you'll become one with the Almighty. Did you see it? That's what it means. All right? Okay. That's what it means. So we know the stars didn't fall. We know all the things that people today that consider doomsday prophecies, Jesus said would be fulfilled in that generation. They're not doomsday prophecies. He's simply saying, okay, that 
You will not pass. In other words, you will not get past there until these things are fulfilled in you. Your thoughts have got to be shaken. You've got to change your allegiances, your traditions. All of that stuff has to be shaken down. Okay? The sun has got to stop shining in you. Your ideas have got to be blacked out. The moon has got to stop shining in you. Your emotions can no longer control you. The abomination of desolation, you have to know. In other words, you have to finally realize that that right side is barren and it is a horrible thing. When this happens, then you will go no more out. Then you will fly up into that which is the holy place. Now that's the way it is. And the holy place doesn't mean you're going to linger out here uh, in the sky somewhere. It means you're going to be one with he who is the Almighty. In a way that is beautiful. In a way that you'll understand. Okay? <clears throat> just, uh, just for a couple of seconds and we'll be done. Look what it says in Matthew 24, 35. Page 26 we're at. Matthew 24 and verse 35. <clears throat> Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. In other words, forget about everything. The one point to keep in mind here. You want to find life. You want to find a purpose for being alive. You want to find a purpose for this world. You want to find a purpose for creation. You want something that you can hold on to. Some, look at it. Look, at, look with me. What's the purpose of this? To make milk. Okay. What's the purpose of this? To make light. What's the purpose of this? So I can hold the message. What's the purpose of this? I can write it. What's the purpose of this? Oh, it makes... What's the purpose of this? Oh, it decorates. What's the purpose of the carpeting? Oh, it makes it comfortable. What's the purpose of the chairs? What's the purpose of the little screws to hold the chairs together? Look, look, look at the guy sitting next to you. Look at the person sitting next to you. Come on, turn around. Tell me. Look at her. What's the purpose of her? <laughs> Nobody knows. The most magnificent creation in here. Nobody knows what the purpose is. Insignificant little screw in this chair. You can tell me right away what it's for. You look at each other. You know why? Do you know why? Because religion tells you you have no purpose. Just to sit, give money, and, and, and pray until they put you in a box. That's your purpose. Your purpose is to be fodder for the snakes or whatever there is under the ground. That's your purpose? That's not a purpose. See? But here you begin to understand, if these things, if you know what everything in this room, what it's created for, certainly you must have some idea what you're created for. And what you're created for is to find the key that unlocks the door to the kingdom, which is the right hemisphere. It opens up, and then you and God become one. And then God's mind is your mind, and it spreads all over the universe, and the wedding takes place, and the planet Earth becomes the planet Heaven. That's your purpose. That's a good purpose. And then it says, finally, in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour no man knows. Not the angels in heaven. No one who can predict. That day. What's going to happen in there? In, you see, this is all consciousness. This is in meditation. And in meditation, it must be dark. It must be dark so that the uh, melatonin can flow. In that day, no one knows. No mind, no thought is allowed then in that place, in that day. If you turn to page 747 in your Old Testament, I'd like everybody to do it in the Old Testament, now not the New Testament, that's the beginning of the book, 747, and look for the rest of you at the book of Amos. Many of you are going to have to find out what page it's on in your, in your other Bibles. But I want, you to, I want to, sh to show you something, okay? Watch this now. I'm going to show you something real neat before you get out of here. And I want to look at something. I'm going to do a couple of prayers, right? Are you with me? Amos, how many found it? Okay, all right. Uh, let's go to Amos, verse, chapter 5. Now, what did it say here? No, watch what, no man knows the day, okay? Now, the day is that place of enlightenment of God. If you go to Amos, page 747 in the Old Testament, in those little Bibles in the new part, chapter 5, and then go to verse 18, what does it say? Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. You see that? Okay, so meaning then to enter into the darkness of meditation, when you enter into the darkness of meditation, what happens? 
The pineal gland comes alive. The melatonin starts to flow. The cancer cells can start to be healed. The immune system can start to be strengthened. Because it happens in the darkness. God dwells in the darkness. And when you enter into the darkness, that's actually when you see the light. See? So what Jesus is saying, no man knows in meditation. No mind, nothing of the mind can be active in that which is meditation. So he's saying there that there is no thought, no human thought allowed into that place of meditation. Now, what is it? No man knows the day. So now we know this is the day, the darkness of meditation, or the, what else do they say? The hour. Okay? Now this is interesting because what this is symbolically is relating this to your consciousness. Your brain, there it is, is made up, and Albert can tell you this, of 12 aspects, six on the left side, six on the right side. I don't know what they call them, cranial, whatever they are. But there are 12 in there, as there are 12 sympathetic nerve systems in your solar plexus, the place of the sun, as there are 12 signs of the zodiac, as there were 12 disciples and 12 apostles and all of this kind of business. It is all built here on the human brain because there are 12 cavities of thought or whatever in the human brain. And when Jesus says no man knows the day, he's saying that the human mind can have no part in that which is the dark place where God's light or God's day is shining, or the hour Okay, and that relates to that which is the 12 aspects of, uh, of the human brain. Watch with me, if you would, and we're just about done. Page 100 in your New Testament, in the book of John, and I'll show you something. And you've got to learn to start reading the Bible this way. You can't literalize it anymore because it was never written literally. It's written in deep mystical symbols. John 11, okay, we're going to relate this to the day of the Lord which we've already found out is meditation, and it's talking about consciousness. If you'll look with me, Jesus makes a statement on page 100 in your little Bibles, John 11, verse 9. Jesus answered and says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? In other words, Jesus Christ is saying, in the day, in the time of enlightenment, the tenets, tendency is to enter within yourself to the 12 aspects of the brain, where the darkness then of meditation, which is actually, as Amos said, the day of the Lord, will fulfill in the 12 aspects of the human brain, the 12 aspects of consciousness. That's why the, the 12 is used, because it, it's, it centers itself, it coordinates itself with the 12 universal symbols of the zodiac, celestial symbols of the zodiac. So we're talking here about Consciousness, total consciousness. And Jesus Christ is simply saying that all of this will be fulfilled, but it cannot be fulfilled by the thoughts in your mind. Shut them down. Because you've got to enter into the darkness of meditation. If you enter into the darkness of meditation, you will be fulfilled in the day of the Lord. And that takes place in the 12 aspects of the human brain, the left side and the right side. And Jesus Christ says, The hour and day are known only by my Father which is in heaven. And John 14, 23 says that the Father dwells in you. The kingdom of God is within you. That means that the germ is activated in the higher mind. Oh my God, this is getting exciting, folks. The germ is activated in the higher mind. Hold on, hold on. Almost done, almost done. Okay, get a little rowdy here. And that which is the Father explodes within you. Do you know where the Father, where God... Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. That's what I just said. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are sitting in this row? Eight, believe that you can do better than Jesus Christ did. One. Of course, Joey. Come up here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, come on. You, me and you, Joe, right? <laughs> Folks, I want you to see this with your own eyes. That's why I try to raise my hand. Right. <laughs> we have one person who said he's better than Jesus Christ right here. Can you imagine that? Do you know what? He's right. Do you know he's right? Do you know he's right? Congratulations, Joe, you win. And all expense paid trip back here next week and two free seats right over there. <laughs> do you know that he's right? Do you know that people shudder? You say, oh, I can't do better than Jesus Christ did. But you know what? Jesus Christ said, the things that I do, you shall do, and greater things than I, than I do, you shall do. Because Jesus Christ did not come to say how beautiful he was. He came to say how beautiful you are. He didn't come to say how spiritual he is. He came to speak, you know what? Because he says, the Father who lives in me lives in you. And if you touch him, the things that I do, you'll do, because then you'll live with Christ consciousness. And not only that, you'll do better things than I'll do. So when anybody says, yes, you can do better than Jesus Christ, you're doing under the authority of Jesus Christ. 
He didn't want you to get down and worship him. He didn't want you to get down and idolize him. He wanted you to stand up straight. And he wanted you to let him burst forth and come alive within yourself so that he could continue the work that he set out to do. And what work did he set out to do? He didn't get killed because he started a new religion. He got killed because he came after the system. He got killed because he shook his fist at the system. He got killed because he started to pull down the system that's hurt you and you and all the rest of you. And he said, no, set my people free. And that's what you've got to do. And you've got to understand that, that you're special. You're the light of the world. You are the branch. He's the one. You're plugged into him. And it says in Matthew 24, 37, as the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And in two weeks, we'll cover that. Next week, we're going to do Buddha and the world of desire, which is an interesting thing of Shakyamuni Buddha teaching. But I hope that you get encouraged by what you're seeing on the television and the press. I hope you get encouraged by what you're hearing and what you're beginning to understand in the Bible and encouraged that you're only thinking with 10% of your brain. Did you hear that? You're only thinking with 10% of your brain. 90% of your brain is dormant. And you are able to tap into that. Jesus says, cast your energy to the right side. What's going to happen in your life if you start activating the brain cells on the right side? You start thinking with 12%, 15%, 20%. What can hold you back from doing anything in this universe? Nothing. And that right side is the vineyard that's planted. That's what it means sitting at the right hand of the Father. When you activate the right hemisphere of your brain, you're sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's why Jesus said, cast your energy to the right side and you'll find. Do it. Do it. And join this universal revolution now. Don't let it pass you by. And get be a part of it because you're not in it alone. Uranus is chugging through the heavens, coming like a bull through a china shop, coming back to reclaim his bride, Gaia, Mother Earth. And the dolphins are swinging and singing and the chimpanzees are chipping. And every, hey, you know what we did the other night? This was great. Frank was there. You know, Prissy the cat, you know, on the, on the show, she was great. She did her best act ever. She, teach, she taught people how to meditate. I, I, said, I had Prissy in my arms and I, what I do with her, just so you know, don't tell anybody, she'll blow this whole deal. I just tickle her rear end a little bit <laughs> and she talks. So I'll say, uh, Pris, what do you think about the show? <laughs> you like me? <laughs> say hello to everybody. <laughs> what do you think of Frank? <laughs> So we put it out. So we put it on. So I thought, oh, this is a great idea. I said, people, here's a cat on the show going to teach you how to meditate. So I said, Pris, got around my hand. I says, uh, you like to meditate? Nah. I said, show people what it's like to meditate. Take no thought. <laughs> <laughs> she stared right at the hand. I said, thanks, Pris. <laughs> <laughs> great. Really great. She's a great cat. Great cat. So see what you can do. Somebody tickles your rear end and say, ah, ah, ah. I meditate. <laughs> Having a good time, Ray? <laughs> Come up here, Rita. I'm going to show you. That is great. Okay. What do you think of me, Rita? <laughs> Pretty serious lecture I had today. <laughs> this is a very serious time, aren't they, Rita? Christian said the end's coming soon. It's going to be an atomic war. <laughs> Armageddon's coming. <laughs> what do you think of her over there? <laughs> Rita, that's great. <laughs> Isn't she great? I'll tell you something. A few weeks ago, though, she... Uh, <laughs> she, she is, and Joan will tell you, and uh, you wouldn't believe this, but it's true. <laughs> she, you know, you hear about laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. She is probably the most magnificent massage therapist you'll ever find. I'm very serious. And Joan, is this true? She is. She is. A, I laugh him to wellness. <laughs> no, she is. She's really good. She practices shiatsu. You know, tickles your rear end a little bit. You get very spiritual. <laughs> Just like Prissy, the cat. She's really good. Teaches vitamins. But she had three shows she did for us on shiatsu and uh, shiatsu and shiatsu. And she did a show on, on uh, nutrition. <laughs> Folks, we got to get out of here. If you have the nerve to send this tape on to someone.